toward us are good. He has a perfect plan and he has an expected end for us. And he says that his expected end for us is a place there with him, a place with him. And he has many, many members of our family there that are awaiting and that there's no, there's no place there for pain. And there's no place, he said, there's no place here for pain. There's no place for sorrow. There's no p place for emotional discomforts. There's no place here that's got anything that would hinder or hurt. He says, prepare yourself for this place. Draw nigh to me so I can draw nigh to you. I have good thoughts concerning you. I have an expected end. Hallelujah, Lord, we thank you. We thank you, Lord, for this place that you have prepared for us. Thank you, Lord, that we're aligning our lives up on this path with you. We're going strong into you, Lord Jesus, strong into your presence. We long for you, Lord God, to have your way. Have your way, Jesus. Help us to worship you the way you desire to be worshipped. Help us to live our lives pleasing before you, Lord. I heard the Lord say, you've never been any closer as a body to receiving the things I've promised than you are present tense. Even at times where you felt that you were close to something, even at times where there seemed to be more emotion among more but emotion does not bring about my outpouring, saith the Spirit of Grace. <clears throat> the truth and the integrity of my word in you working its work is the fullness of my spirit to bring about what I have promised. For I have promised that in the last days this gospel would be preached. The one that my son, my firstborn preached and demonstrated with signs and wonders and miracles and though at times it seems as if things have slowed to a crawl and the crowds wane because of the truth that has been built in you and the fortress of my sayings that are being done among many not all but many there is an edifice being built in this place that is closer to the things that you desire than ever before, saith the Spirit of Grace. Continue to stand. Continue to stand. For it is closer than what you realize. The winds are blowing. The strength is coming from out of my spirit to encourage you to stand and to continue to stand. For close is the revival and close is the outpouring, saith the Spirit of grace. Close is the shaking that I will bring to this area of Florida. And many will come from all places as I prophesied through my servants from the beginning. Many will come and some will stay to help out in the revival. But many will come and partake and drink of your water, of your cistern. Stay in this place, saith the Spirit of grace. For I'm raising you up and you've never been more closer than you are right now, saith the Spirit of grace. Hallelujah, Jesus. We just want to check because we're going to really covers some material this morning and a lot of it I'll be just reading from my notes that way I'll stay on point but I believe that we will receive um, more on prayer 101 is the series and this morning we are going to be sharing why we pray in tongues some of the reasons we're not going to get to all of them today because there's a number of different reasons why we pray in tongues and, uh, but this morning we're going to talk about uh, two of the reasons, just uh, for a little bit, uh, the power and mortification. And uh, I believe that you're going to receive something 
are very powerful before this day is over. So let's just pray again. And you agree with me just in agreement. Pastor Dave used to say, stretch your faith this way. But Father, we worship you. We glorify you. We thank you for this opportunity to go into your presence again. Into your word. Take one more step into the proposition of revival. The, the, it's more than just a probability. It's a, an exactness we know. But Father, in the name of Jesus, I can do nothing of myself, but I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So I thank you, Lord, for the day and hour that the blind see, the lame walk, the deaf hear, and all those wonderful things that we ascribe to revival. But Lord, the journey, the journey into revival is just as precious as the revival itself. The journey into your word that is dictating our future. The destiny that we have in front of us will be fulfilled by that which you ascribe to us through and by your word. I thank you that your word is truth. And I thank you for the teacher, the Holy Spirit. And I give you all the praise and glory. I receive that grace this morning in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. So while we pray in tongues and the power and mortification we're going to discuss, what did we forget last week? Can somebody tell me? Yes, we did not ask that anybody needed to be baptized in the Spirit. We're going to pray for people to be baptized in the Spirit even if there is nobody here because we're going to speak to the camera. And we're going to do this. This was an instruction last week. Um, so I'm, I'm looking around. There might not be anybody, but there, there very well could be. Hallelujah. We're just going to obey God. Amen. That's the main thing, just to obey God. So Homer did an excellent job Wednesday night. Very, very powerful. Uh, the Lord has really been showing him a, a lot of wonderful things. And I just love to talk to him because I always get edified and listen uh, and take notes when he is teaching. Hallelujah. Let me read something to you. I know you'll recognize where it's from. This is, uh, I don't know if you've ever seen this book. Most of you have. It's called The Walk of the Spirit, The Walk of Power. Hallelujah. And it's by uh, my pastor, Pastor Dave Roberson. Amen. Hallelujah. I'm just going to read the introduction to you this morning. And then the first prophecy that goes along with it. He said when he wrote this, and this is what he penned himself, the past few years have been some of the greatest years of my life. I've been in the ministry more than 25 years. Now that's obviously increased now. And have many wonderful, had had many wonderful encounters with the Lord. But I can truthfully say that the revelation knowledge of God has imparted to me in these last few years has completely changed my life. Taking me to a place in God I had never before imagined. However, you can put up walls, you can't put up walls where there is no foundation. And you can't add a roof where there is no walls. The life-changing truths God has been showing me couldn't have been added to my life had not a strong foundation of the word been built inside of me, line on line, precept upon precept, through many hours and many years of praying in tongues while meditating on the scriptures. I know now more than ever before that praying in tongues is the revelation gift that helped me, that helped lay a scriptural foundation in my life. God was getting me ready for an awesome eternal truths he is now pouring into my spirit in preparation for the days to come. He is using the culmination of all those years of praying in tongues to open up to me a whole new realm of understanding in Christ. The very measure of God's power in a believer's life is departed on how much of his life is ordered by the Holy Ghost. 
Therefore, from the very beginning, the primary message of this ministry has been praying in tongues. Over the decades, the Lord has imparted a wealth of revelation knowledge to my spirit on this subject. Step by step, he has taught me how to walk out of, out of life dominated, of a life dominated by the flesh into a new life dominated by the Holy Spirit through the matchless gift of praying in my heavenly prayer language. In 1997, the Lord spoke strongly to my spirit, saying, This message on tongues has come to maturity. At first, I thought God meant the message had come to maturity in me. Later, I came to understand that he wasn't just talking about me in particular at all. He was saying that the time had come to share in a broader measure the revelation knowledge he had given to me over the years regarding praying in tongues. The message had come to maturity for the body of Christ. The Lord has uh, commissioned me to teach believers how to live a life of power as they walk in the Spirit, always building on the foundation of the Word and praying in tongues as the Holy Spirit gives utterances, uh, utterance. This book is written out of my desire to be, a faith, uh, to be faithful to that divine commission. I have not only taught the truths contained in this book for many years, I have also pursued them with all my heart in my own personal walk with God. So believe me when I tell you this, as you read this book and diligently apply its principles, the day will come when you look back on your life and say in awe and wonder, I am not the same person. I have learned to walk in the spirit and it has completely changed my life forever. Now I want to read this little prophecy that came along with the first introduction. For in my spirit is the depth of wisdom that by my spirit you may glean, saith the spirit of grace. For these things are hidden in a mystery. Oh, I have made these mysteries available to those who are in the, in the church of my grace. Learn how to walk, stay in my presence. Learn how to stay on your face. And I will open up treasures hidden in a field. And you will see, saith the spirit of grace. And even the devil will have to give place. Hallelujah. I have read this book more than once. I think by reading the introduction, uh, I think it's time for me to read it again. Hallelujah. Um, this is a tremendous. This, this book changed my life along with, of course, the word of God. Um, but. That's also, I'll just, just to give advertisement to it. Let me give it, let, okay. He said do this. Let me give this advertisement. Listen, listen to these chapters of what this covers. Chapter 1, the Holy Spirit's work within. Next chapter, my personal journey to revelation knowledge. Spiritual gifts and operations. Diversities of tongues in God's government, the four basic diversities of tongues, Paul's source of revelation, praying out the mysteries of God's plan, the channel through which the Holy Spirit speaks, the edification process, purging and mortification, overcoming impasses in prayer, purging to stand in the gap, praying and fasting, the two power twins, how to effectively pray in tongues, the divine process to agape love. Hallelujah. Man, that's powerful. That's some powerful stuff. And uh, so I think it's time for me to read it again. But um, I remember Miss Gay saying that when Marty put this book in her hand 20-something years ago, I guess it's probably been, she said, she read the introduction. She, that's it. That's what we've been looking for. And then they followed this book to this church. Hallelujah. Um, recently... Uh, I, I learned that a, a, a friend of Roberts Bailey had uh, we, she she she's been coming. She hasn't wasn't yet filled with the Holy Spirit, and I was really looking forward to getting the opportunity to pray for her th today, since we're praying on the our teaching on. But I understand that uh, because of the 
the uh, teaching and the understanding that Robert and Herb have been uh, talking over the last month. Um, this past Thursday, she, she just went into her bedroom and uh, into her prayer closet and received the Holy Spirit with the evidence of praying in tongues herself. Hallelujah. And just prayed and prayed and prayed. And uh, I thought to myself, Bailey, you're taking away my job. <laughs> I want to feel like the Maytag repairman here. here so, hallelujah. But I want you to be able to, I told Bailey I had a book for her. I'm going off camera. This, that, there you go, Bailey. That'll, that's one that'll change your life along with the Word of God. Hallelujah. Amen. So if you have Pastor Dave's book, I would encourage you to read it again. Valuable Truths. Well, Pastor Bronk, do you have one that I can? Nope. Sorry. They're, they're as scarce as they call hen's teeth. And I've got, you can go online and read it PDF right off of his website. And you might be able to contact um, their ministry and they may be able to send you some books. But I have to reserve uh, whatever I've got left for people just like Bailey. Amen? So praise the Lord. Um, if you haven't read it, we may have a library book, one that you could bring back to somebody else and, uh, d you know, do it like that. I don't know. Hallelujah. But it is worth reading. Praise the Lord. I'm, you know, in the early days, we just passed them out like tracks. We just passed them out. And we sowed a lot of seed to the wind, in which we want to, now we understand if you're really hungry, you really want doctrine? Really, 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 really? You, okay, beg for this. Okay, beg, 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 beg. Okay, jump, jump up. No, okay. Hallelujah. All right. Um, praise the Lord. We're looking into the subject of prayer. That's where we started last week, this prayer 101. Number one, for the rem I will say this. For as a reminder to those who have already have an understanding in this area. And number two, because um, it never hurts to be reminded of how important it is to pray. And number two, for those who are just learning the process of enduring prayer. Enduring prayer. I'm not talking about a flippid prayer. I'm not talking about just, you know, one off the top of your head. You know... I don't want to, I have to be careful with this because I don't want to put myself on a pedestal. I, I hope that this gleans something inside of you that somehow it's a mark inside of you. But when somebody asks me to pray, and you know, everybody, well, I'll pray for that. I'll pray for that. I'll pray for that. You know, you'll talk to somebody you don't even know and they say something and they say, well, I'll pray for that. You don't pray. You, you forget. Or if you do pray, it's like, just before I'm going to sleep, God, uh, help them. <laughs> God, help them. God, help them. What kind of prayers? God, help them. <laughs> I don't consent to praying for people real quick. Because if I tell a person I'm going to pray for them, in my estimation, it's like the Supreme Court will hear you now. And I'm not elevating myself, but I'm saying when I, when I, when I receive a prayer request, and I say, okay, I'll take that to the Lord. Well, what about everybody else? Well, listen, that's where a lot of that tongues come in, because I, I, I can't cover the, the face of the earth. And the other thing is to teach people to pray for themselves. But if I receive something, if I say I'm going to pray for it, you can bet it's usually not the kind of prayer that most of your friends tell you. It's not as I'm going to sleep. It's not as I'm, you know, lifting weights, exhausted, out of breath. I, and I pray all the time doing that too. But if, I've got, if you put a petition, you say, Pastor, will you, will, you, will you pray? You've got some quality prayer going on for you. Hallelujah. See, one reason why there's no power in the church, nobody respects the power. Because I'll pray for you so flippant. It's just so flippant. It's just like prayer is a 
something of a reality like Candy was sharing this morning, there's a real God. And our communication to him and our prayer time to him and our asking and our receiving, and we're, we're establishing the different prayers. Yes, there's prayers for asking. There's many prayers for asking. There's petitional prayers. There's uh, the, one, the prayer that we talked about last week. It's kind of in the prayer category uh, because we're communicating but we're communicating against diseases. For God's sake, you never ask God. I mean, the silliest thing that you can ever do is to ask God to heal you. God, will you heal this person? You've already started the prayer off in unbelief. You've already started. You're on the wrong foot right to start with. You're not really getting too far with that because he's already, what, you, what he wants you to do is act like Jesus and cast it out. Just just send it on its way. Well, I didn't know that before, but I've had, I, well, he loves you and he'll help you, but here's where knowledge is increasing. We don't stay ignorant, okay? We learn. Praise God. And that's through the Holy Spirit. Well, I had the best intentions. Wonderful. I bet you did. But let's take our intentions to knowledge. Let's combine it with knowledge and get the job done. Hallelujah. My desire is to invoke in you a desire to pray, pray, pray until you can't pray no more. <laughs> Hallelujah. To pray in your prayer closet and pray as you go down the road and to pray as you're working, to pray as you're doing whatever you're doing, to pray continually. Hallelujah. Prayer is a, is a habit. You have to develop a habit. Praying in tongues is a habit. You have to systematically get yourself in the habit and after a while you'll be doing it when you don't know you're doing it. Amen? Okay. So that was, I know you're listening, that's good. But I hope that numerical a, amount of amens was not a consensus of how many really are doing it. <laughs> okay. Amen? Amen? Hallelujah. Glory to God. Uh, let's look at Ephesians chapter 6, verse 18. This is kind of the jumping off place of, um, I could say the foundation verse probably is the best way to say it of this particular series. Ephesians six eighteen. you're turning in your Bibles or your iPads or your smart device. Hallelujah. Okay. Look at 18 says, Paul says, praying always, that means at all times, with all prayer, that's all kinds of prayer, and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. The Amplified says this, same verse, pray at all times. On every occasion and in every season, in the Spirit, with all manner of prayer and entreaty. There's different kinds. We're going to go over those different kinds. But this morning, we're talking about our favorite, which is praying in tongues. I have to say that. That's got to be our favorite. To that end, keep alert, the Bible says. Watch with strong purpose and per perseverance interceding in behalf of all the saints, God's consecrated people. So pray at all times with all types of prayer. Okay? Well, how do I know which type of prayer? Well, that's what we're teaching on. And if the Holy Spirit ever becomes your best friend, he will teach you along with the Word of God. You'll, just, you'll, you'll, you'll grow in the knowledge of the Lord. We're starting our favorite with our, start of, with our favorite kind of prayer, which is praying in tongues or baptism the spirit. Now I'm going to say some kind of real kind of sounds kind of uh, ABC one two three or redundant in the knowledge of where many of you are at. Um, to pray in tongues you must first be born again and then filled or baptized and then as a result of the baptism some, sometimes people equivocate the tongue as the baptism. The, the, the tongue is the gift of the Holy Ghost. The baptism is the Holy Ghost. 
it's, 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 they're really kind of inseparable, but if you want to put them in a microscopic and look into the depth of it, it's you're baptized, and as a result of your baptism, you're giving the gift of speaking in tongues. Hallelujah. And that's, that's the right way to, to think of it and say it. Um, to pray in tongues, you must be, of course, born again. It is not our objective at this moment or during this teaching right now to prove that the born-again experience and the baptism of the Holy Ghost or Holy Spirit are two separate works of grace. And, of course, they are. They're, they're separate. Um, that's where you'll get a lot of really wonderful fundamentalist, uh, just good people that are born again but don't necessarily believe or they don't practice praying in tongues. And they'll tell you, a lot of them will tell you, well, I got filled with the Holy Ghost when I got born again. Not really. You got a new nature. You've got God on the inside of you in that you've got the nature of Christ. You, are you going to heaven? Absolutely so. Can you live above sin? Absolutely so. But is there a second work of grace? Absolutely so. It's the, the power of the Holy Spirit. Um, it's also not our objective at this moment to prove that it's God's perfect will for everybody to pray in tongues. Every single born-again believer should have the gift of of praying in other tongues. A lot of people that believe in it will say, I believe in it, but I don't know that it's for everybody. But we can prove through Scripture. Uh, it's not our objective this morning. We'll probably go over it at some point over the next several weeks. I don't know, but it's not our objective this morning to prove that. But it is God's will for everyone to speak in tongues. Um, the act of regeneration and the baptism are so closely related, though, in Scripture. I mean, they're so, this sandwich is so tight. They're so closely related in Scripture that it's obvious that God intended that these to be simultaneous. In other words, you're born again, spirit-filled, now. I mean today, as soon as possible. Do not pass go. Get it done to now. You know, get, get things done now. We're going to give that illustration uh, just out of the Word of God. Um, so let's go to Acts chapter 10, and I'll show that to you, um, how close these two works of grace really are, because we want to talk about praying in tongues later, and how the, the Holy Spirit has an effect specifically on the mortification uh, of our body and our stand against sin. Um, so Acts chapter 10, verse 1. Now we're gonna, not going to read through this chapter. There's too much. But I'll just let you know that there was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion of the band called the Italian band. A devout man and one that feared God with all his house, which gave much alms to the people and prayed to God always. Well, I like this guy. He's a prayer guy, even though he's not yet born again on, at, that, at that point. So now you can look up for a moment, because then we'll go back into 10 in just a moment. This is Cornelius. The whole story in a synopsis, he, because he's a prayer man and he's seeking God, and uh, an angel appears to him in a vision, tells him to send to Joppa, that there is a one Peter, Simon Peter, who is at... Uh, Simon the Tanner, I believe. I, I can't remember. That didn't. No, I, I think I read through that again yesterday. But anyway, uh, he's at this guy's house. He's a tanner. In other words, he tans hides, and he he lives alongside the uh, the the lake there, the seaside. And uh, so this whole thing is, these men go, and they don't know Peter, and these men are uh, Romans. He's a centurion. Now, quickly, I'll just tell you this, not for fact purposes, just so you can enjoy what we're about to read, is that a centurion was over 100 men. Um, he had um, about 80, 80, 80 legionnaires, foot soldiers, and about 20 household servants, people that kind of just did, you know, do what I'd you know, tell you to do, go blah, 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 blah. And that kind of helps us understand what the centurion said to Jesus. That's not the same centurion, but he said, when I say go, come, 
they come and go. And he would do that. He could do that to any of his soldiers, to the legionnaires, but he could also primarily, there was, uh, uh, I read a number of different places, and they also, they said, the, the couple of them said the same thing, that there was about 20 different, 20 people that would usually be um, uh, ascribed to these, to these centurions that they could just, you know, lived, kind of lived in their house. Because these men were, um, they were paid real well by the Roman government. So this guy here, he's a Roman, he's a Gentile, he sends for Peter. Peter uh, gets a vision simultaneously as these men are coming, and it takes, this takes a few days to take place. And uh, the whole thing about the sheet coming down, the, and all the creepy creeper creatures and all that stuff, and God says kill and eat, and he's all doing all that for, for an illustration to say, what I've sanctified, uh, Peter, I know that you still believe that the Gentiles can't be saved. But I can sanctify any and everybody through the blood of my son. And I'm showing you this illustration. And because Peter would say, every time this sheet would be let down, three times it was. And he said, no, Lord. Because he says, uh, kill it. Kill it and eat it, Peter. And he basically was arguing with God, I've never eat any of this stuff, you know. And God said, this stuff now is clean. And what he's saying is the Gentiles are clean through the righteousness of Jesus Christ. So these men show up. They go back to Cornelius' house over, a, you know, a day's journey. Uh, these guys stay the one night, go the next day. Um, and so we pick it up in verse 38. This is where Peter comes into this house of Cornelius and we skipped a lot of verses here and you got to understand that he one part here I don't know if it's in what I've got copied here but he invited all of his friends and his kinsmen and so I hope you don't uh first of all this guy probably had a an immaculate house a big house I can see these Roman uh columns you know just really nice maybe they're in a garden area but I hope you don't think that there was five or six people there um, I, you know, I'm thinking the man probably had more there than they had on the day of Pentecost. I mean, they probably had a couple hundred people in there waiting to hear uh, this guy's coming. They, they've already been told. They already got some knowledge. They've already been told um, this guy is going to come, and when he gets here, he's going to tell us how to be saved, or he's going to tell us the words of life. And we, we know, because we respect Cornelius, and he said he had a vision, he saw an angel, and the angel told him to send for this guy because this guy knows what to tell us. So we pick it up. This is Peter actually standing there talking to them in verse 38. And God, he says how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth. Okay, he's, he's into this sermon now. Peter's into this sermon. He's talking to all of them. He says, he anointed him with the Holy Ghost and with power, who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. And we are his witnesses of all these things which he did both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem, whom they slew and hanged on a tree. Him God has raised the third day and showed him openly, not to all the people, but to, unto witnesses chosen before God, even to us, who did eat and drink with him after he arose from the dead. And he commanded us to preach unto the people and testify that it is he which it was ordained of God to be the judge of the quick and the dead. To him give all the prophets witness that through his name, whosoever believeth in him should receive remission of sins. He's preaching repent, remission of sins. And while he's doing this, I love this. I mean, the Holy Ghost just blows Peter's service to pieces. Hallelujah. He has, Peter has no control over his services. God help us to have, that Bronx Flint has no control. The right, the right, not, not chaos according to the flesh, but no control like this. And while Peter spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on all them which heard the word. Look at that. The whole, that I mean, that's a testimony right there. The whole crowd, that's a confirmation that it's God's will for everybody. Can you imagine a whole a preacher preaching and everybody in the service was prior to not filled with the Holy Ghost. And while he's preaching, everybody, it said all of them, all means all. Verse 45, 
And they of the circumcision which heard, that's the ones that came with Peter, were astonished. As many as came with Peter because that the, on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. For they heard them speak with, and somebody said, well, okay, the gift of the Holy Ghost. Now, I love it the way that Luke records this because he gets real specific. I'm not just talking about the baptism and you want to say that it was along with their salvation. He says here, they spoke with tongues. Tongues. Let's get real specific, Luke, and magnify God. Then answered Peter, Can any man forbid water that these should be baptized, which have received the Holy Ghost as well as we? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. Then prayed they him to tarry certain days. Now, here's what's really cool. Uh, the, the neat thing is, the simultaneous how quickly and how instantaneously there, there was no you know we we've got it in our minds this cookie cutter thing obviously got the, they had to be born again first but the born again and the baptism there was no altar call it was like and they, they you know we want to do okay get here's an altar call lead you through the sinner's prayer then we're going to train you to uh, get baptized in water. So we're going to baptize you next month and you're going to get baptized and then you're going to get filled with the Holy Ghost. And while he was, he was preaching repentance and nobody had even said the sinner's prayer out loud like, can we pray the sinner's prayer? They just in their hearts received that word and they were repenting obviously. That's like, we believe what he's telling us. He's been talking to us. And while they're sitting there mesmerized, bug-eyed and looking into what this man's telling them about this man that came, died, resurrected, and now is the, the repentance back into, or to God, all of a sudden, all of them just start speaking in tongues. That's what we just read. That's awesome. Peter didn't say, you know, wait a minute. We're supposed to have a prayer line. Wait a minute. I'm supposed to teach you on uh, the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Wait a minute. I'm supposed to teach you on the baptism of the water. It's just bam. That's power. And that's where we're headed. Praise the Lord. The baptism of the Holy Spirit and the gifts, the gift of tongues was the first thing that Jesus wanted for his disciples. Now let's look at Acts chapter 1. We're going through this systematically. Some people have never heard this. Some people have heard it only a few times. It's very, very important because we're also going to pray at the end of this service for people that are watching and people that are here that need to be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Look at Acts chapter 1, verse 4. This was uh, the first thing that Jesus wanted for his disciples. And being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, ye have heard of me, for John, for John truly baptized you with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. And then in verse 8, skipping down a few verses, but you will receive or shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost is come upon you, and you shall receive, and you shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria and into the uttermost parts of the world and to Immokalee and to wherever. Hallelujah. You'll be. But listen, we've already proved a few weeks ago we showed you um, uh, through a couple of scriptures where that what we just read and what Luke recorded here and what Mark recorded in chapter 16, what is called the Great Commission, those that was done and said at the exact same time. That was simultaneously said in one, one end, like I'm about to go away. And we showed you that verses, the verses that, that prove that. Um, the power that was to come upon them, when Jesus said you will receive power, the power that was to come upon them was not the power of the new nature. That's not what he's talking about. Um, Jesus basically was saying this, don't do anything until you're filled. Don't evangelize. Don't write doctrine. Don't preach. Don't pray for the sick. We said, Pastor, they were already praying for the sick. I know they had been praying under Jesus' mantle. Now he's gone. Now they're in that sliver of time where uh, uh, now they got to get their own and it's not going to be a mantle anymore. It's going to be innate. 
innate. In other words, inside. It's going to be their own. It's going to be their own power. So don't evangelize. Please don't tell any. Please don't go out and get. <laughs> Peter did the only thing I think that was outside of, of the intention of God when he wanted everybody to. Before they got filled, he wanted everybody to cast lots. And, uh, okay, Peter, hallelujah. You're good, you know. After, after that, you never find in the New Testament that it, they ever cast lots. It was always separate. Un, you know, the Holy Ghost said, separate unto me, Paul and Barnabas. The Holy Spirit said, the, the leadership of the Spirit, blah, 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 on and on and on. Hallelujah. Remember, the new nature does not, why did they need the power? The new nature does not raise the dead of its own power. I'll say that again. The new nature does not raise the dead. What you've got inside of you that raised you from the spiritual dead, that doesn't, in and of itself, that's yours. Okay? That's yours to live above sin. That's yours to uh, walk in truth. It's the receptacle of truth. It can receive truth taught by the Holy Spirit and by the Word of God. But that new nature does not raise the dead. Okay? It does not raise the dead. It is the Holy Ghost working in you and through your new nature that raises the dead. How important is that? How important? The baptism of the Holy Ghost and praying with other tongues is for external, listen to this, and internal purposes. Two things. Everybody still with me? Everybody say this. For internal and external purposes. Thank you. Externally, it is for the power and the demonstration of the gospel. Okay? Uh, what, do you ever, you ever notice why Jesus didn't say you were, he didn't say, and I, I've said this a few times recently, he didn't say go tarry and wait because um, you'll receive power to not sin anymore. That, that wasn't the, the, the main objective. That wasn't the objective at all. This power is externally. They were already receiving by the witness of the born again nature see the disciples were they were born again in that upper room I don't know if it's the same upper room they used for the baptism when Jesus breathed upon them and said receive the Holy Ghost okay so he and then he says whosoever sins you remit they're re, they're remitted there was uh, there was there was like several days several days before from that time to the time that they were filled with the Holy Ghost don't you think that the disciples told every single one of them? Uh, don't you think that Peter, James, and John, and all of them told the rest, those 120, receive what we've got? Jesus breathed on us. We've got a new nature. Receive it. I don't know if they had the, all the terminology that they later were taught by the Holy Spirit, but they knew something had happened. So that 120 is sitting there waiting for the power of the Holy Spirit. Glory to God. Hallelujah. I'm excited. Are y'all excited? We're going to receive an outpouring. Um, eventually, or, or I said externally, I should say, it is for the power and demonstration of the gospel. Internally, it is for the aid of the Christian to be conformed to the image of Christ. Uh, Acts 2 1 says this. You're right there. Look at it with me. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, there were all. There were all with, they were all with one accord in one place, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire, and it sat upon each of them. Ever, I tell you what, folks, you've got fire on the inside of you. You've got fire if you've been baptized with the Holy Ghost. Your new nature is not related to fire. But the Holy Ghost has baptized your new nature with fire. Hallelujah. Glory to God. And I am fired up. Glory to God. And they were filled with the Holy Ghost. They were filled with the Holy Ghost. And began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Immediately after that. Bam. Immediately after that they began to evangelize and do miracles. After that. The power flow of the baptism through the individual was the utterance of other tongues. He, baptism, fire, but the flow that came through them was the utterance of other tongues. Praying in tongues prepares us for our ministry to the world 
and to our fellow Christians as we minister life to them and healing and those kinds of things. When we pray in tongues, we are setting up a power flow of edification to our spirit. This power flow is internal, the internal equipping for the external ministry. Okay, just a verse on that. And we're not going to teach on that verse today. 1 Corinthians 14, 4. He that speaketh in an unknown tongue edifieth himself. But he that prophesieth edifieth the church. Edified means to build up. You're building up your spirit through the edifice. Or, or the edifice of your spirit is being built up through the process of praying in tongues. That's the power flow. Okay. Praying in tongues for mortification. So we're going to just going to switch a little bit here. And... Uh, we're going to talk about mortification. How does, it, how does praying in tongues relate to mortification? We'll define mortification in just a moment. For those of you that are watching that don't know what exactly he's talking about when he's saying mortification. But we're going to talk about how the Holy Spirit aids or assists in the mortification process. In the light of, let me say this, in the light of the power of the new nature. Hallelujah. That's how we're going to see it. We're going to see how he assists mortification in our life through the power of what we've already been created to be. Amen. So to do that, go with me to Romans chapter 8. And we're going to look at Romans chapter 8. Hallelujah. I'm so glad you're here. Those of you are watching, everybody, I appreciate you being a part of what is being taught today. Hallelujah. This chapter, as you get there, and, and don't get into it, reading it too much to start with. Let me just listen, or you just listen to what I have to say, and then we're going to read it together in just a moment. But I want to tell you this, uh, Romans, it's a book I love, a book I've been through many, many, many times. But I can tell you Romans chapter 8 is the perfect combination of the power of the born again spirit and the ministry of the Holy Spirit through tongues. The ministry to us through the edification of tongues. So we see two things here in this chapter. We're going to see the power of the born again nature and the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Before we start on this subject of mortification, it is important for me because we want to talk about the aid of the Holy Spirit, but it's very important that we first talk about the power of the born-again nature. Before we start on this subject of mortification, it's important for, for me to mention some things necessary to understand His, that's the Holy Spirit's, ministry in regards to mortification. I will remind you, you don't have to turn there, but those of you that followed along with us as pastor, he won't, he won't want me calling him pastor, he's one of my pastors, but as Gary Carpenter um, taught um, on 1 John, which was a very powerful series, um, I, I will just remind you very briefly, uh, one of the major or main themes in 1 John, um, and I'll just read this for you as a kind of a quick synopsis of to one of those major themes. 1 John 1, 5 says this, This then is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you that God is light and in him is no darkness. Everybody say no darkness. Yes. Now this is uh, one of the major themes, or maybe the main thing. If we say that we have fellowship with him, that's God, and we walk in darkness, I want to say habitual darkness. If we do that, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us, what? From all sin. Now one of the things that we learned from that, and we've learned, I mean it wasn't just that, but it was very, that was a very powerful echo of truth. It was a bullhorn of truth to all of us. Cleared up some gray areas. Very, very powerful. Uh, but the Lord's been teaching that, you know, along and along. We've all been gravitating to that same message. If a man says, one of the things that we learn, I'll just use that series as an example. If a man says that he's born again, a born-again believer, 
and continues to walk in habitual sin, he's a liar. Well, what does that mean? That means he is not born again. If he's continuing to walk in sin, killer sins, I used this terminology, Gary loved it, deal breaker sins. <laughs> somebody, you know, if you ever want to talk to somebody that wants to muddy the water, get, listen to somebody who starts telling you all sins are the same. They're muddying the water so they can make a point about being able to disguise their own sins. If you just put every, if you just muddy up everything, <laughs> then there's no, there's a confusion. So, well, run, somebody told me one time, he said, running a stop sign or doing this, that, and the other is just as wrong as committing adultery. You can't be any further away from the truth. There are prescripted, there are certain, listen, all disobedience, the word says, is sin. In other words, if, uh, if the Lord has told you for the last 10 years to pray an hour a day and you haven't been doing it, uh, that's sin. But for heaven's sake, God Almighty, <laughs> nobody's going to go to hell for not spending the right amount of time in prayer. That's not a killer sin. But there are killer sins, and we went through them, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, Galatians chapter 5, and Ephesians 6. Uh, there are prescripted, I mean, it's right there. And every single one of those three different passages say, those that do these things will not inherit the kingdom of God. In other words, they're, they are, they're deal breakers. If you, were, if you were saved, if you're doing those things, it'll break the deal. Your spirit will die. So we're taught, we taught several lessons on that reference, to those references. If these, are, if these deadly sins continue to be practiced habitually after a man says that he knows Christ, then he's a liar. In other words, if there was no abating, he just keeps going. He's a liar and there's no change in him. In regards to Romans chapter 8... The Holy Spirit does not, I want to say this, and this is vitally, vitally important, that you really need to get this. Because when we're talking about the mortification of what, the assistance of mortification that the, that the Holy Spirit has in the life of the believer, this particular part is very important that you catch this. The Holy Spirit, and when I'm talking about the Holy Spirit, I'm talking about, we're going to talk about our subject matter is what? Praying in tongues. The Holy Spirit does not recreate the will. And I'm talking about not the willpower. The, you know, somebody says, there's no reason to recreate the will. I mean, if it's been already done, we don't have to do it again. That's the adage. That's what I'm using. The W-H-E-E-L, not the W-I-L-L. -L. The Holy Spirit does not recreate the will by praying in tongues for us or with us. The Holy Spirit does not recreate. I didn't hear him say this, but I heard uh, Gary say that he said this. And he's a friend of mine, Richard Edgard, uh, used this terminology, the mechanism of righteousness. I thought that was a pretty good expression of what we have been created to be. We have the mechanism of righteousness, the compass of truth on the inside of us. The Holy Spirit does not recreate the mechanism of, of righteousness when we're praying in tongues. In other words, as you're praying in tongues, it doesn't matter if you give yourself to a, a million hours of it. He does not create or recreate. He was the original creator of your born-again nature. But once he's done that, there's no need to do that again. And all the praying in tongues does not do that as you're praying in tongues. One thing that that does, I love what, once you get that understanding, it really eliminates, really takes the elimination off of the excuses of somebody says, you know, I did that because I have not been praying. <laughs> it didn't matter. It didn't matter if you weren't praying. Well, I got so weak because I, I wasn't praying. Listen. <laughs> the Holy Spirit, while you're praying in tongues, does not create or recreate the will to say no to sin. That was done at the creation of the new birth. Well, I'm praying that the desire, that, the, that he'll create a desire in me to, to stop sinning and do, stop doing what I'm doing. Well, you're not even saved then. If the desire's not already there, you're not even saved. 
What you're saying is you're giving yourself over to another mindset, uh, which is the mind of the flesh, and you're believing something about yourself that's not true. But the mechanism of righteousness, that's already a million hours of praying in tongues won't create the will to stop sinning was created the moment you're born again. Amen. Hallelujah. But does he assist? Yes, he does. But how does he assist? And we're going to get to that in a little bit. The Holy Spirit does not create the same thing twice. Why create, I'm praying in tongues so I'll get a desire to stop sinning. <laughs> That desire was created in the moment you were born again. Well, I don't have that desire. Well, one or two things, you're just, def you're just not born again. Or you're just listening to a side of you called the flesh. At the rebirth, the eternal and divine and absolute no. Everybody say it with me. No. The a divine no to sin was created inside of you at the rebirth. Ephesians 4, 24, you don't have to turn there. And hath put, and that you put on the new man, which after God is created. It's just created in righteousness and true holiness. A million hours of praying in tongues does not make your born again spirit man more righteous or more holy. But it does assist. And we're going to talk about that assistance in a little bit. There was a divine, absolute, and eternal no <laughs> to sin created within your spirit when you were born again. Praying in tongues does not create the no, doesn't create it. It was there when you were born, again. The new nature is the apparatus. You want to say, oh, I love that term mechanism, but the new nature is the apparatus that holds the divine no inside of it. Praying in tongues does not directly take away the desire to sin, from you but it does we're going to talk about how it assists in just a few moments now to do that we're going to look at Romans 8 how are we doing hallelujah. we're doing good hallelujah the person listen the person you became at new birth gave you that desire to stop sinning now let's look at Romans 8 verse 1 because we're going to look at this and I'm going to have to really skip over a lot of stuff because you could teach man a teacher could teach Romans 8 for centuries really but so I'm just going to say acknowledge the truth acknowledge the scripture and keep going there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit, stop quickly. There is, therefore, is the answer to chapter 7. It's that great argument. What I want to do, do you know what? Listen, as long as you're a Christian that can't, hasn't come to the reconciliation of understanding chapter 7, if that has not been taught to you, you're going to live a defeated, sin-filled life and if you do make heaven, you're going to be in continual jeopardy because what you're going to do is you're going to believe that chapter 7 was a blank check written to the church for an excuse to sin. Because if Paul could sin or if Paul had weakness to the flesh, then I must have weakness to the flesh. Paul concludes that whole chapter, and I wish we cannot teach that, but Paul concludes that that chapter, which there was no 7 and 8, he concludes it with chapter 7 and saying, that identification that I once identified with as an Old Testament believer who had a desire according to my mind, but I could not keep the law because something inside of me, even when I desired to keep it, it kept falling prey to the, the, the person that was on the inside, which was that dead nature, that was death, that dictated Paul or any man. Paul was standing in the personification as an example of everybody. The, there, you know, in the, there, there, there was two types of people in the Old Testament. There's people that could care less. They could, don't give a you know what. 
But there were those who loved God as much as they could, like David and different ones. And even though they loved God, they, they still couldn't stop sinning at times. David wrote some of the greatest psalms, and you'd think, my God, this man is filled with the Holy Ghost. And it was the Holy Ghost speaking through him. He wasn't born again, and yet David had the capacity to kill a, kill a man and take his wife. And somebody said, oh, that's, the, that's the one I identify with. That's the <laughs> Because Paul said, the thing that I want to... <laughs> that's not you! That's guys that didn't have a new nature. We got it. We're born again. That, that groaning that Paul was, uh, was expressing for everybody that lived under the law and could not keep it is totally fulfilled in verse 1. Now there is therefore, since we've come into Christ... No condemning sentence. That condemning sentence, and again, the body of Christ thinks that means like, you can't condemn me. Don't condemn me of my sin. That's, that, this is a judicial term, meaning this now, in this time, that which had control as oh, a condemning over all umbrella of control over you, no longer has the power. The power plug has been pulled on that. It has no longer a condemning sentence to make you do what you don't want to do. There's no condemning sentence to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus, that in a nutshell is your born-again nature. That law that defeated the law of sin and death is the law of life, which is in Christ Jesus. Hath made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin condemned sin in the flesh. That the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit. And somebody said, what are you talking about flesh? You're talking about when I cursed the other day or this, that. This is all a position. When, he talk, when he's talking about the flesh, he's talking about that nature of the flesh. That prior to born again person who did not have a new nature. They walked after the, the flesh nature because that's who they were. And he says here in verse 5, And they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the spirit, that's that born again nature. Boy, we talked for years. Sometime we'll maybe teach it again for those who've never heard it. Uh, all of the differentiation between all the the small caps or the small and the, the capital S's here. The little S's versus the, the big S. Little S is your spirit versus the big S, which is the Holy Ghost. It's very, very important. But as of yet, we haven't heard from the Holy Ghost yet in our readings. We're just talking about that spiritual man that you were created to be. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity, that means it's totally in opposition against God. For it's not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So then they that are of in the flesh cannot please God. In other words, to live after that nature, there's no way to please God. But ye are not after, not in the flesh, but in the spirit, little spirit. If so be that the spirit of God dwell in you, that's that spirit that we got from God, there has come of God, that's our born again nature, dwelleth in you. Now if any man has not the spirit of Christ, that's that born again nature, he's not his. And if, any, and if Christ be in you, the body is dead. Of, uh, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. And I'll just tell you this. Your body, you know, according to emotions and according to what you can feel, it don't feel dead. It don't feel dead. This is a positional truth. But it's by this positional truth that all of the other inroads execute the truth of domination over your body. In other words, all the inroads. We're talking about the inroad of praying in tongues. Fasting works because your body has positionally been declared dead. And why would it be, decla why would it be declared dead? Because it has appetites in it. It has appetites in it. I like what Gary Carpenter says. He says, your body... 
no matter what, you, you know, your spirit is one thing, of course, but your body, your flesh, le just left without the dominion, it's, it, it can't do it as long as you have to take dominion. But is, if you just let your body do whatever it wants to do, it thinks, it thinks all the adultery that you can have is just wonderful. It thinks all the drugs that you can have. It thinks gluttony is fine. It thinks drinking is fine. The body will never, ever be sanctified in the sense it'll have a sanctification as of the dominion that the spirit holds over, but it'll never be changed from those appetites until we go home. It's still there all the way through our Christianity. Romans 8, 11 says this, but if the spirit of him that raised, it's still talking about the spirit of him, that's that life that was in Christ, that came from God, rather, that raised up Jesus from the dead, dwell in you. He that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwelleth in you. Now let's talk about the heirs of Christ here in verse 12. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors, not to the flesh, but to live after the flesh. For if we live after the flesh, you'll, uh, this is 13, is very, very powerful. If you live after the flesh, once you've come into the spirit, if you live after the flesh, you'll die. First John, I'm going to stutter. I want to get this out. I want to get it out. I want to get it out. I want to get it out. Woo! First John, here we're looking at bookcase. We're looking at two ends of a bookcase here. First John says, if you, don't, if you don't stop habitually sinning, you never were born again. But once you come in, if you go back to habitually sinning, you will die. Both ends. <laughs> Hallelujah. The mortification message that we're going to share this morning and try to finish up is the, is the mortification that Paul was speaking of here and the assistance that the Holy Ghost gives. It's not the mortification that is used so much in the church and even the church that learns this message of praying in tongues and uses it as a hall pass to say, I'm in mortification so I can stay in my sin. I'm in the process. It's like a woman that's pregnant. I'm, uh, Natalie, how far along are you? Only got six more weeks or so. Natalie's in the process. Believers that live after the flesh that learn this message will say, I'm, I'm in the process. I'm pregnant with praying in tongues, but I'm living with my girlfriend. That's not mortification. You are not in mortification if you're already in the sin, the habitual sin, and yet you say you're praying yourself out. Well, I'm going to pray myself out of this thing by praying in tongues. No, you're not in mortification. You're in mortification when you get in the car, crank it up, and leave. Otherwise, if you stay in that, you will go to hell. Well, we don't live together, but we sleep together a couple times a week or two or three times a month. That's habitual. What's habitual? The, the, the second time? The second time. Now you've made a habit of it. Well, I repent. Do you know what? Here's the thing. You get off of that repent stuff. Well, that repent stuff, should we? Yeah, you can repent. But I can tell you this. If you repent with premeditation and keep going back. Repentance, the word repentance, I don't know where well, the church got off on this. Repentance means stopping it. The word repentance means to stop. If you, if you repent, you, when you say, well, I repented, but I did it again and I did it again. I did. You didn't repent. And the problem is the thinking that you can do it and then say, Jesus, forgive me. After a while, you will go into what is called a reprobate mind. In other words, you will say it with your mouth, but you don't believe it in your heart. And it doesn't matter if you say, forgive me, forgive me, forgive me, forgive me. He can't forgive you because you're not truly repenting. Your words are a fallacy in your own mouth. They are your own deception. You can come to the place where you keep doing the same sin enough and you say, but I keep repenting for it. No, uh, you can get to the place where you, you can go around killing people and your mind is so it's so derelict but I repent over it every time pastor repentance means stop 
the mortification process is stop now. But can he assist you with the urges? Can he assist you while you're in your fight? Can he assist you? Yes, he can. Glory be to God. Well, we're living together, but I'm in mortification. No, you're not in mortification. Get in the car, leave, or go to the, the um, courthouse. I usually need a few months to marry somebody, but to keep you from going to hell, I'll marry you the next day. Because it takes 24 hours, I think, for the license or something like that, 48 hours. And then you need to, you, if you have no place to stay, you, the man, you can stay at my house so y'all don't go to bed that night. Because if you go to bed and do it again uh, and you get killed in a car wreck, you still, you still probably go to hell. You say, Pastor, this is strong. It's the truth. This is the gospel that raises the dead. Hallelujah. Uh, the positional truth of your body. Which, which, but verse 11 says, But if the spirit of him that raised, we read that. Therefore, brethren, we are not debtors. Verse 12, 13, we did. This is where we're at. If you live after the flesh, you'll die. But if you through the spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, you shall live. Hallelujah. First John teaches that if we continue to sin habitually, we never were saved. Romans teaches us that... Uh, if we return, we've already said this, but I'm reading my notes, to a habitual lifestyle to sin, we lose our salvation or we die. True mortification comes through the Spirit. Now, the Word says it's through the Spirit that we mortify. The word mortify here is thanato. It's, uh, I think, of Thanos, the bad guy. Yeah, Thanos. You'd have to be an Avenger to do. The word means to kill. Literally or figuratively, it means to make or become dead, to cause, to put to death, to mortify. And he says it's through the Spirit that you mortify. Oh, I know, praying in tongues. And then you mortify. No, no, no. He's not. It's still a little less. It's through your born again nature. See, Dave even said years ago, he said for years while he was on this journey, that he taught that this was the Holy Spirit. And then he realized after he got further, aren't you glad for, our, for Pastor Dave and, and the Born Again Trail? I'm, I'm telling you, the Born Again Trail is probably the paramount, it's just probably the foundation that was given to this generation to understand all kinds of other mysteries. But Pastor Dave said, I once thought that it's through, when, you know, through the Spirit that you mortify the deeds of the body. He said, I once thought that that was, and I, he said, I even taught it was through the Holy Spirit. But it's not. He said, it's through your born again spirit. The mechanism of righteousness. The apparatus of no. It's through that that you have the power to say, no, I'm not going to do that anymore. Well, is there assistance? Yes. There's assistance. But for you to say, the will's not there, that's wrong. That's a lie. To say, I can't. To say, to even use the assistance that's coming. I got some assistance. But if you misuse the assistance and say it's going to create the will, you're already deceived. And you're deceiving yourself. And I, well, I got to, I'm going to pray until I get the will. No, you're already, you're misusing. You know, and I thought to myself, Lord, how can I explain this? Because I'm explaining it so many different ways. But then, the, but then I understand this. If you're a person wanting to sin... It doesn't, if you're a person that wants to give excuses for your <coughs> drinking, drugging, looking at porno, men doing things for themselves, now all that will send you to hell. Sure. It'll send you to hell if you don't repent from it and stop it. But if you're a person that just wants the excuse, it doesn't matter if I explain this all day long. You'll still reject it and say, I don't agree with Pastor Bronk. I don't agree with this. I don't agree with that. Yes, There's no amount of me getting it over to you that will ever make you agree with it. Right. Hallelujah. Does everybody still love me? <laughs> I'm going to look at you. Yeah, I think you still love me, don't you, Carl? Yeah, <laughs> hallelujah. What spirit? It's through the born-again nature, the, 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 the uh, spirit, you're born again Again, that confirms the divine no that's on the inside of Pastor Dave, I said in the early days, would preach 
This is the Holy Spirit. Well, look at 14. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For ye have been, for ye have not received the spirit of, a, of bondage again to fear. Or, or, or you've not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you've received the spirit of adoption whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. Now, here we go. That's the first mention of the Holy Ghost. Here we go. He shows up. Here we go. The Spirit himself or itself, the better translation would be himself, beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. The first time the Holy Spirit's mentioned here. Okay. And if he says, and if children, then heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with him, we shall also be glorified together. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time, the time that Paul was living in, the time that we're living in right now, are not worthy to be compared to the glory which shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the creature. Now you can just substitute the King James says creature. It's the word creation. It's talking about the, our planet. Wait is for the manifestation of the sons of God. This planet, somebody said, the devil's creating the hurricanes, the earthquakes, the, the famine, the blood. That's, I mean, listen, that Jesus told us that that's going to come. And the reason why it's coming, it's not because the devil's creating it. It's because this planet is dying. It's groaning. It's saying, I want the manifestation of the sons of God to be manifest. I, I want them for the, to have a new body, for me to have a new body. I'm a dying planet. For creation, I'm just going to read it like it really is in the Greek, verse 20. For creation was made manifest, or was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him that has subjected the same in hope. Remember when God said, okay, Adam, you're cursed, but the ground's cursed also. Both of them were cursed at the same time. The planet didn't do anything, but it had to be subject to the same vanity. That's the curse. That's the fall uh, that man was subject to. Um, it says, because, again, the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain until now. That's the earth. That's the hurricanes. That's the storms. That's whatever. And not only creation, the King James has they, but that's italicized. It's not there in the Greek. And not only creation, but ourselves, ourselves, which self, our born again spirit self, ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the spirit, which is the new nature, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit, to wit, it's not there. Wit means to be made complete, but that's, it's, it goes along with the context. The redemption of our body. Let me read 23 again. Not only creation is in groaning, I'm putting that in there, but we ourselves that are born again with the first fruits, the fruit of the born again nature, we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption of to be made complete, what re adoption? The, the redemption of our body, our glorified body. When we go home, or you know, when, when we're received. This is the morning, that there, that groaning is the mourning uh, of Matthew, like mourn, like the grievous mourning of Matthew chapter 5. Um, we're also studying uh, Sermon on the Mount series. And we were doing that Sunday night. We'll be doing that again tonight. Uh, Gary covered that eloquently, wonderfully. The, somebody said, Pastor Dave used to say, you don't walk around with groaning in, on the inside of you. Oh, yes, you do. If you're born again, you don't recognize it. But the mourning or the groaning is if you, unless you're just so self-centered that your whole life is about you, when you see the little crippled children, when you see those that are being afflicted and those that are starving and those that are dying and the, the children of war and you see uh, molestation among, uh, for little kids and stuff, something inside of you says, oh God, I hate that stuff. Oh man, that just makes me sick at my stomach and I, I want them healed or I, you know, I just want to, I want to, that's our mourning. That's that new nature on the inside of you that's grieving. 
It's in intercession in that sense. But now we're going to switch over to the Holy Spirit. We're mourning for the injustices of the world. We're also mourning for our own. It's not just the injustice of the world. We're also, the word says, we're groaning within ourselves. That mourning or that groaning is, is crying out, I want a new body. I fought this one through mortification for years. Listen, mortification is not just something we do, it's who we are. We just live that way. That's who we are. We're always keeping under the body the dying of the Lord Jesus Christ, which Homer did an incredible job on that. Amen. Intimacy. Knowing him, following him. Paul also reconciled that it was not only that he died daily for the intimacy of following him in all things, but also in 1 Corinthians 9, 27, he said, I keep under my body. I bring it under subjection. Lest I, having preached to others, I myself become a castaway. I'm sure that Paul, because he's the one that wrote Romans 8, he understood that the process that the Holy Spirit that we're about to read would help him keep under his body, that mortification process. We are, we are not only moaning for the world to be changed, we're moaning on the inside like, God, I want a different body. This doesn't match up. The, uh, let me just read this. We are also mourning for our, our adoption to be made complete and the redemption of this body with a new body. The spirit man is mourning the body that it has to presently live in. The spirit man doesn't, the spirit man really doesn't like the body that it has to live in, the appetites of it. Do you understand? Uh, you can go along with your flesh. You can go along with lust. But if you're living out of your spirit, when that thought comes, it says, uh-uh, no, that's not a reflection of who I am. And you're taking orders from me, big boy or little boy. I'm the big boy. I hate that appetite. The spirit man is mourning the body that it has, has presently to live in, in. The spirit man does not like the weakness of the flesh body that it has to presently live in. The flesh compared to the spirit is a weak, milly mouth. Please let me do it. Can I please just do it one time? And I won't do it no more. If I can just, if I can just look one time. Just let me look one time. And I won't do it no more. The flesh is the biggest fat liar and you want to give it a shot, you want to give it a protein shake, you want to give it a steroid, you want to give it a really good shot, give it one time and it'll grow up just a little bit. It'll pack on some muscle. Give it a couple of times and then it'll start flexing its muscles. And then when the spirit says, no, you're not going to do that, it'll say, shut up. Feel this emotion. And you're like, oh, yeah, it feels good. It feels good. Mm-hmm. <laughs> My wife makes me want to cry when she amens me. Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. L Galatians 5.17 says this. For the flesh lusteth against the spirit. And the spirit against the flesh. These are contrary the one to the other. So that you could not do or cannot do the things that you would. The present appetites of the body are a weakness against the very strength of who we really are. My spirit is groaning to get out of this body and to live in a body that is perfectly compatible. There's an incompatibility here. I, what I am on the inside and what I am that has any lust of the flesh, these two are different. And my flesh is saying, God, put me in something that represents who we are. That's the groaning. Now the Holy Spirit's going to help with that. Romans 8, 24 says, For we are saved by hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For what a man seeth, why does he yet hope for? Hallelujah. Stay with me. We're doing good. Keep going. 25, For if we hope for what we see not, 
or if we hope for what we see not, then we do with patience. Wait for it. Likewise, in the same manner of this groaning that your body, your spirit doesn't like the body that it's in. Okay, here, here we're going to get some assistance. We're going to get some backup here. Likewise, the spirit, this is the Holy Spirit now. Also, he also comes along with that groaning. We got first a new nature that says no. But here we're going to get some backup in the sense of the word of how he helps us. We have to understand. Likewise, the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, also helps our infirmities. For we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself or himself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Uh, likewise, in the... In the, the, the uh, it likewise, in the same manner... That our spirit is warring or moaning against the weakness of the flesh. So the Holy Ghost himself moans for us with groanings that cannot be uttered through our human capacity. The word uh, infirmity here means, in the Greek it means feebleness of mind or body. By implications of malady or malady, malady morally or a frailty. It can also mean a disease, an infirmity, a sickness or a weakness. Pastor Dave used to say it like this, that he, that the, he, the Holy Spirit, moans for us against the weaknesses that are imposed, or we could say are tried to be imposed by the flesh. Now let's focus on the specifics. Man, how many are still with me? We got to conclude this. Uh, let's focus on the specifically, how does the Holy Spirit war with us in this mortification process? Because again, he does not recreate the no. And he does not create the, the will to say no. That was created there. Well, how does he help us? We'll go through the remainder of Romans 8 later because uh, we don't have time right now. Let's look at 1 Corinthians 9. Or no, 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 no. That's the scripture that I quoted to you where Paul says, I keep under my body. And knowing that Paul wrote Romans 8 where I'm sure that he had uh, a great understanding of this. How does the Holy Spirit help us? Um, turn with me. Now I got it. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Look at verse 6. We're going to get an insight of how when we pray in tongues. Should we pray in tongues? Pray in tongues until you can't pray no more. We're going to pray for anybody that needs to, to be baptized at the end of this service. Okay. Look at verse 6. How be it, Paul said, we speak wisdom among them that are perfect. That's us. You perfect people, born of God. You're not perfect as in having grown up into the full nature of Christ. But what was placed in you at the moment of your salvation is perfect seed, righteousness, and true holiness. You'll never get any, you can't grow in righteousness. You can't grow in holiness. But what can happen is this. We speak, he says this. Yet not the wisdom of this world, nor of the princess of this world that came to naught. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery. Even the hidden uh, wisdom, which God ordained before the world unto our glory. Which none of the princes of this world knew. For had they known it, they would have crucified. They would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, I have not seen nor ear heard, neither has it entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for them that love him. And that's not talking about the pie in the sky when we get to heaven. It's talking about the present tense now that those things of the spirit, those things of victory, those things of the knowledge of who we have been created, it cannot enter in to the natural man. And in other words, <clears throat> the man that has not yet been born again. But you are. Hallelujah. Wave at me if you are. Hallelujah. Mm -hmm. But as it is written, I has not seen nor ear heard, neither has it entered the heart of man. We've got that. But God, verse 10, has revealed them unto us. What? By his spirit. Now again, we're not yet to the Holy Ghost. That new nature that you've got inside of you carries within it the capabilities of receiving all the wisdom and understanding of God. For the Spirit searches all things, yea, the deep things of God. 
For what man knoweth the things of a man except the spirit which is in him? In other words, you're identified whether of a natural man or a spiritual man by the very person of who you've become, which is the born-again person. That's who you are. Even so, the things of God knoweth no man but the spirit of God. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God. That's the born-again nature. We're still got that, we're still talking about the power of that born-again nature. That we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. In other words, he's simply saying here, the reason why you can be taught is because you have a capacity through the new nature to be taught because you're sons and daughters of God. In, 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 in a nutshell, these verses we just read. He says here, which things, okay, now we're about to bring in the Holy Ghost. Which things also we speak, Paul said he's talking of himself as a teacher, as, a, as a, an apostle. Not in the words which man's wisdom teaches, or teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual Paul was saying that the things that he taught was not given to him by words of man's wisdom, but by the words in which the Holy Ghost teaches, the language of the Holy Ghost. The Amplified says this, And we are setting these truths forth in the words not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the Holy Spirit, combining and interpreting spiritual truths with spiritual language to those who, who possess the Holy Spirit. Through praying in other tongues, the Holy Spirit compares the spiritual things of truth in the Word of God of who we are in Christ with the spiritual things of who we are in our born-again spirit. This is called revelation knowledge, by the way. Hallelujah. Kirsten, come up here. Okay. You, you come up here and you stand. I'm going to pick on Kirsten. Is that all right? Kirsten said, I don't know if that's right or not. Okay, you just fake. Now, Kirsten, I know you're filled with the Holy Spirit. So you don't have to do it very loud, but just start praying in tongues. Okay? And don't stop until I tell you to. Okay? Okay. So Kirsten is praying in a, her, her heavenly language. Isn't that neat? Uh, and she, even if you smile or whatever, she, can, she doesn't have to stop because she's edifying herself right now because she can turn it on and turn it off like a switch. Amen. That's how we are. So she's praying uh, the mysteries. Don't stop. Okay, she's praying the I want to see your lips going. Uh, <laughs> she's praying the mysteries. And, uh, but what is this scripture telling us? It's saying that the, Paul said that the Holy Spirit is comparing spiritual things to spiritual things by the words in which he teaches or the language in which he teaches. How many of you know the Holy Spirit only has one language that he really teaches real well with, and that's praying in tongues. And so I am, let, let's say I'm going to edify myself or, or I'm going to elevate myself rather. I am the Holy Spirit, okay? Okay, I'm the Holy Spirit. You see me out here, but I'm also in there because I'm creating that language. She's not just muttering. She's actually speaking in tongues. I wish you could see it real well on the camera, but she's speaking in tongues. I don't know what she's saying, but I'm the Holy Spirit, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring forth an edification of knowledge to her. What she's already been created as the person on the inside is righteousness and true holiness. I've already created that once. Now I've baptized her, and now I'm speaking based on her own will to continue the edification process. But what Paul is telling us here is that he compares the Holy Spirit, I'm him, standing on the outside. In that process, while she's praying, he uses that language which he flows through her as a medium of exchange to bring forth the process of revelation. Do you, everybody understand that? In other words, here I am. I'm the Holy Spirit. I'm in her praying the language. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to compare spiritual things with spiritual. Well, you can't get any greater truth than that which I hold in my hand, which is the Word of God. This is the spiritual things of God, which will also be compared. Now, I, while she's praying, this is her life, okay? She's praying in church right now, but this is her life on a daily basis. As she continues to pray this language and look into this word of truth, what I'm going to do as her friend, companion, I'm going to go to her and my backup process of mortification to her is this. It, I'll read my notes in a moment. 
The way that the Holy Spirit assists in the mortification process is not recreating the divine no again. That's already in there. But what he does do is he comes through knowledge of the Word of God and compares that knowledge of the Word of God to who we have been created and tells us this is who you are. Make no excuses to the flesh. So here I am. She's praying. This is her daily, you know, this is Monday or Tuesday or whatever. And she's looking into the Word of God. Maybe she's not praying at the same time, but she's looking to this Word. She prays in tongues. So I, by the Holy Spirit, I'm her teacher. And I'm saying, look here, Kirsten. Uh, I know that you, this, this, is, this is who you are. This, you see this right here? Uh, honey, um, there's, no, there's no need to be discouraged. You know that depression that was trying to come on you? Uh, this is what my, the, my word says right here. That you, you've not been given a spirit of fear, but of power and love and a sound mind. Oh, honey, I, I know as you keep praying in tongues, let me compare something spiritual with something spiritual on the inside of you. You know how that, mm, I, I hate to say this, uh, you, you know how, because I know Kirsten, she's not like this, but you know how the lust of the flesh came on you, trying to come against you, and that reasoning came against you, and it said, you know, uh, you're a single woman. You should be able to do what, well, let me put it like this, what most other Christian single woman women do. You should go out and sew a little, have a little weekend, you know, do a little pate. But honey, this is what my word says that you are. You are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. You've been declared. You don't stop praying. Until she's saying amen. <laughs> she's saying amen because what is on the word in the word as she prays in tongues, the Holy Spirit identifies and says, see that? That's who you are. Okay, thanks, Kirsten. She did a great job. Amen. It's comparing spiritual things. He's not coming and saying, I'm going to pray in tongues and I'll eventually give you the willpower to stop sinning. All he does is magnify through the word the truth of who you already are in Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. Well, that's some good stuff right there. Let me just read this and close. The divine and eternal no against sin is already created within the born again spirit. That's mortification. That's already, already there. The Holy Spirit likewise helps our infirmities when he prays for us by comparing spiritual things with spiritual things. His aid to us in mortification is the continual revealing of Christ in us. Progression by knowledge. That's the, that's the progression of growth in Christ is by knowledge. There is a progression of growth that comes through knowledge. It's not a progression of righteousness. It's not a progression of righteousness, but a conforming to the image of who, who Christ is in us. The more we see who we are and what we have become and obey that knowledge, the more we are renewed in our minds and our bodies are brought under the conformity to the image within us. Amen. Glory to God. That's just good stuff. The Holy Spirit aids us in mortification of our bodies through knowledge. Second Peter, boy, Homer did a great job on this. I can't wait for him to teach some more, and he's coming right up to bat. 2 Peter 3, 18 says, But grow in grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be glory both now and forever. Amen. So pray, 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 till you can't pray no more. He will assist us, hallelujah, in our knowledge. Let's, let's all stand. <sighs> Praise God. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Appreciate that. Hallelujah. Father, we worship you. And we're not going to forget. And I'm, I, I, I'm not going to try to spend a lot of time on this. But um, I will invite anybody that does not yet speak in tongues. And you would like to speak in tongues. Um, I'm going to pray for you. And I'm going to pray for the camera. And we're all going to pray. We're all going to speak in tongues together. If you're here this morning and you don't pray in tongues and you would like to pray in tongues, please come forward. Okay? Is there anybody here that's not yet baptized with the Holy Ghost with praying in other tongues? Hallelujah. Let me talk to the camera for just a moment because we're all going to pray. Um, praying in tongues and the baptism of the Holy Spirit is... 
the next work of grace after salvation and as I proved this morning through scripture that it comes simultaneously. It can come simultaneously. It, it can come down the road. I mean, you may be saved for years and then get baptized, of course, but it can come simultaneously. So if you're a new Christian this morning and you're watching or if you're someone here, you know, you can do it in your seat, but I'd like to lay hands on you. But the simplicity of it is, is this. You do not have to seek for the Holy Spirit anymore. You just have to accept him. It's a thing of faith, just like salvation is faith. You didn't see Jesus. I don't think any of you have ever saw Jesus walk through the wall when you got born again. You didn't see him, but you believed. And when you believed, it happened on the inside. Salvation, I mean, baptism is just the same way. You have to ask, and then you have to receive. And usually there's a prayer prayed. And it can be just by yourself. That's one of the askings that's fine. That, that's a, Lord, fill me with the Holy Ghost. The other thing that Jesus said, if you ask the Father for the Holy Ghost, he will in no wise give you a serpent or scorpion. I can tell you this, nobody that ever sincerely just genuinely asked, Lord, give me the Holy Ghost, ever got anything stupid like a devil or some kind of idiotic thing. God always makes sure you get the truth of the Holy Spirit. So with that in mind, whatever you begin to speak, once you initially, and it's just like this, it's like stepping off a cliff. When I've prayed for a lot of people, and I pray for them, and initially they just keep saying, uh, I was, there was a man the other day, I was trying to get filled, and he just kept saying, I said, just receive, and then now start to speak, and whatever comes to your mind, just let that pout, let it come up and let it start coming. I don't care if goo goo ga ga. I don't have my, everybody's language is different, but it's but listen, you can't keep saying I love you Jesus. I love you Jesus. He, the Holy Spirit's not going to interrupt that. The Holy Spirit's not a devil. He's the Spirit of God, and devils control people. Devils just make them do stuff. The Holy Spirit doesn't make you do anything. You kind of have to just do it yourself, and He joins in with it. When you start doing it, it's like, okay, I'm going to do this and I'm going to open my mouth. I don't care. This is real crazy. And I'm going to say something. And when you start, the Holy Spirit starts and, and I don't give people instructions. Okay, say this. And then they say that because the word says that he gives the utterance. And then people sometimes have gotten filled like that, but then they get home and they say, no, I was just doing what he said, you know, so the devil takes it away for a season of time. So this morning, I'm going to pray. I'm going to pray for everybody. If you need to come up, please. We all had to come up at one time and, uh, or, 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 or wherever we're at, make that initial stand. Um, Bailey got filled the other day in her prayer closet. You can get filled at home. You can get filled at your seat. But I'm telling you, you have to take that step of faith. Let, let's pray. I'm going to pray for everybody and everybody watching. And then I'm going to release the power of God into this house and everybody that's watching that they might be filled. Father, I thank you for the message and for your people that have pulled with you and pulled with me this morning, receiving this message on the power of the Holy Spirit, praying in tongues and mortification. Now, Lord, this beautiful ministry that we've been given by the Holy Spirit to assist us and to aid us in what our, our own spirit is already groaning against. And Father, we just ask that if there's anybody here that's not filled or anybody watching that's not filled, we just release the power of the Holy Spirit for them right now in Jesus' name. Now everybody say this prayer with me. I say, I say that Father, I ask you for the baptism of the Holy Ghost. I thank you that Jesus said, if we would ask you, Father, you would give us the Holy Ghost not anything else. Father, I ask you for the Holy Ghost. And I receive it now in Jesus' name. Amen. And so all of us, most of you in here already feel, but let's go through this exercise. Just breathe in. I love the way Donner does it. She says, just breathe in. And then just kind of let, let, let the breath out. And then now speak. Everybody, y'all, let's all pray in tongues. Those of you that are watching, those of you that anybody in here, be filled with the Holy Spirit. Don't, 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 don't pray. Don't pray, I love you, Jesus. Don't pray in, the, in, in, his, uh, in, in Spanish. Don't pray in Creole. Don't pray in English. Whatever your language is, stop. 
and they'll just start praying in tongues. Be filled with the Holy Ghost. Be filled with the Holy Ghost. Be filled with the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah. I got, I got to, I got to pull, rein myself in because I could just get caught up here and stay for a while. Hallelujah. And then forget about you. And I don't want to forget about you. You're great. You're great. Hallelujah. How many were edified? Amen. I was edified. I appreciate you staying with me and pulling with me. We love everybody out there. Amen. Um, if anybody needs prayer other than what we just prayed for, um, I'm available just for a few moments. So God bless you tonight. Back on Sermon on the Mount. Blessings to all of you. Amen.